Okay, so last session we covered the two arguments from infallibility. Our conclusions were was that the only the first argument has to do with LDS truth claims. As remember, this argument has the following premises. Apostles and prophets do not make mistakes, either personal, what we call sins, or theological, so ideas about God or the universe. Premise B, Joseph Smith and those that claim a title of apostle or prophet after him made, made mistakes, both personal and theological. Therefore, the conclusion, Joseph Smith and those after him are not apostles or prophets. In fact, um, most critical arguments against the church can actually be reduced to uh, the argument from fallibility. So we went through a number of them, whether it was the teachings of blood atonement or Adam God by, by Brigham Young, um, the fact that... Uh, you know, polygamy was uh, instituted and then, uh, and then uh, was no longer a commandment. Um, if you want to go to Mount Meadows Massacre, for example, which is a horrific event in, um, in the history, of, but uh, done by, by fallible people, um, and on and on and on. Even if you get to Joseph Smith's personal life, um, did he make mistakes? Certainly made mistakes. So uh, much of the criticisms is, uh, of the church are, can be reduced to the, the criticism for fallibility. So premise B was, was, is undoubtedly correct. Mistakes are made both personal and theological. The question then is, uh, comes down to, uh, excuse me, premise B is correct. The question comes down to premise A. Is it supported? And I showed multiple um, examples from both canonized and non-canonized texts that show that um, premise A is not supported. In fact, it's specifically refuted. So the conclusion is, if one accepts premise A, he or she does so based solely on their personal opinion or decision without appeal to the Christian tradition. So, of course, you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to say, look, as I view it, apostles and prophets cannot make mistakes, either theological or personal or whatever. If you do that, you're stepping entirely outside the Christian and the LDS-specific tradition. So I argued that it's not reasonable to define the Christian idea of a prophet or apostle in a way that actually contradicts the Christian and LDS-specific conceptions of that term. It's, it's a technical term, is what we call it. So it's not reasonable to bring your own assumption, your own definition to a technical term. So we talked about that, that premise A is false, and therefore the argument from fallibility fails. The second argument from fallibility we discussed was actually, I think, more interesting for believers of LDS truth claims and for those that are investigating, investigating LDS truth claims. And this is about the utility of uh, LDS authority in your life, given the fact that it's fallible. It's very easy to say something won't make mistakes, therefore we should follow it. That's an easy, um, easy leap of, uh, of logic. Um, if things are fallible, why should we follow them? What, what claim does LDS authority have on us? Um, we, we used a paper, a well-written paper by uh, Nate Oman, um, and this is uh, pretty, pretty much his conclusion that we walk through in, in this second segment of fallibility. We discover church doctrine by offering the best possible interpretation of Mormon texts, practices, and history. Accordingly, church doctrine is a necessarily interpretive concept and a contestable one at that. Right? This means that it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint what exactly is church doctrine. And there's multiple conceptions. Oh, is it, you know, only things that all the 12 put out? Is it everything that's spoken from a pulpit? Is it this or that? It's, it's a contestable one. So it's neither a perfect reflection of the mind of God nor a clear and complete set of theological and ethical propositions, right? There's errors. There's errors in, um, in all revelations, and they admit that. They freely admit that. So, nevertheless, Oman concludes that there's three arguments, argument from covenant, from divine involvement in the production of church doctrine, and from participation in the church that all justify treating church doctrine as an authority. So we went through each of those arguments and really articulated them and talked about them. Furthermore, furthermore while he thinks that Mormons are, in some sense, under an obligation to follow church doctrine blindly, he does not believe that this means that the claims of church doctrine in Latter-day Saints are absolute or limitless. So we talked about those instances where the argument um, from epistemic vantage would fail. That's from divine involvement in production of church doctrine. How, um, if, the, if you felt there was a particular area where you were more qualified than church doctrine, that that argument would fail. And then we talked about what does that mean for you, and that's actually a really interesting topic as well. So arguments for ignoring church doctrine in the context of continued allegiance to its basic authority, however, must take the conceptual structure of that authority seriously and accordingly will be limited by it. Um, so that was really the, the second part of our, uh, our talk on, on fallibility. Um, 
So our conclusion, again, was that there's two separate arguments for fallibility. Only the first concerns the truth or falsity of LDS truth claims. So we have to pull them apart. If someone says, um, why should I follow people that make mistakes? They're clearly talking about the second argument from fallibility. It has nothing to do with LDS truth claims. Only that first one does, and it's a circumstantial argument. Um, the second argument does not relate to the truth or falsity of LDS truth claims, right? It's only about the rationality of hearing to authority that is, that is sometimes incorrect and uh, whether or not that is um, meaningful in your life. Uh, then we talked about the three reasons, either from covenant, divine involvement, production of church doctrine, and participation that would justify treating do church doctrine as authority. So now we want to move to the argument from polygamy. Um, our sources here um, really only, li only listed two, Brian Hales, Joseph Smith's Polygamy, Volume 1 and 2. Uh, he has three volumes, but 1 and 2 are the historical part, uh, the third is the, the theological part where he, he offers more of his opinion on the, uh, on the research. Um, from the critical side, you can get this anywhere, you Google Joseph Smith Polygamy and you'll get probably you know, 2,000 results, but uh, we've been using Jeremy Runnell's CES letter that's available online. He kind of pulls the common um, arguments uh, together for us that have been around for, for decades. Uh, Brian Hales has done a great job pulling together every known historical document on this topic that we have. Um, and so it's a, in terms of primary research, it's, it's really um, indispensable uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of using it. So if, if people are not using it in their research, you can, tell, you can tell them they need to at least take account of all the research that he's done. So some preliminaries on this topic. First, polygamy on earth is inherently unequal and difficult. It expands a man's emotional and sexual opportunities as a husband as it simultaneously fragments a woman's emotional and sexual opportunities as a wife. You cannot get around this, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, so this will not be some, uh, some defense of the practice of polygamy on earth. I, I think it is um, very clearly um, unequal and difficult, and the, the history teaches that. When you read these people's histories, um, very difficult on them. Secondly, there are large historical gaps in the documentary record. So just as an example, Joseph Smith, right, who was the only individual who could have definitively explained his motives and intentions for the practice, left no personal record about these matters. Right? So we look and look through some revelations, 132, some others, sermons, a hodgepodge of statements collected from newspapers, memoirs of others, affidavits, notebooks, we'll talk about um, a, a, a court case about it, but many sources are secondhand, late, they may suffer from reliability issues. Joseph never wrote his personal feelings about plural marriage. Right? So everything on the subject comes from the people around him. So it's uh, inherent difficulty in terms of dealing with the topic. Therefore, early Mormon polygamy is a historical puzzle that we can at best awkwardly reconstruct from fragmentary recollections. Um, but the one thing that we can say is that it's apparent from rem reminiscences that those who practice it were convinced it represented a religious practice instituted by God. So if you want to go through all the primary research, if it's by the Kimball having the vi a vision or on and on and on, whether or not true that the people that practiced it were themselves convinced that it was instituted by God, um, not a way to um, have more sex uh, for, for men. So uh, those are some preliminary um, things to keep in mind as we, as we go through it. Brian Hale sums it up, um, I think, well. He says, after studying the lives of the early saints, we admire the convictions of those who accepted the challenge of polygamy into their lives. We have also mourned with those that faced remarkable hardships. For people already familiar with trials, plural marriage represented perhaps their greatest challenge. All right, so let's get into the arguments. Uh, there are two, that, uh, two or three that we'll cover from polygamy. Here's the first one. Uh, premise A, polygamy is never commanded by God. Premise B, Joseph Smith claimed that God commanded him to practice polygamy. Premise C, a prophet or apostle does not lie about receiving a commandment from God. D is a conclusion we reach from A and B. Joseph Smith lied about commanding, God commanding him to practice or institute polygamy, right? If God never commands it and he claimed it, then he was lying. If he, and if he lied, he cannot be a prophet or apostle. Therefore, E, Joseph Smith is not a prophet or apostle. Um, so this is argument, uh, argument one. Let's start with premise B. Did Joseph Smith claim that God commanded him to practice polygamy? Um, 
did he make that you know specific claim, or again, was it um, if you looked at like John C. Bennett, who was a uh, uh, he lived with Joseph Smith for about three weeks and then um, started preaching kind of a free love type society. Um, and, and he never claimed that God told him to do it. He just said, look, it's not a sin if you keep it quiet. You have sex and you keep it quiet. Um, so did Joseph Smith make the claim that it, God commanded him? Um, let's go back to 1831. Between February 9th and April 4th, February and April, Joseph Smith is translating the part of Genesis having to do with Abraham taking additional wives. And then through to September 12th, he translates later Genesis texts covering other polygamous relationships. It's oftentimes in the, the process of translating um, the Old Testament that we get Revelation. So we get the book of Moses and the book of Enoch uh, during this translation. So the translation process uh, uh, always prompted Revelations. In March or May of that year, he did receive a revelation about shakers. They encouraged celibacy. So we have this in DNC, our current DNC 49. Whoso forbiddeth to marry is not ordained of God, wherefore it is lawful that man should have one wife, right? So we have nothing about polygamy there, but it is a revelation about marriage um, and about celibacy. Joseph Fielding Smith in 1935 says that, um, that some type of revelation on polygamy was given in 1831 in July. The exact date I cannot give you when this principle of plural marriage was first revealed to Joseph Smith, but I do know that there was a revelation given in July 1831 in the presence of Oliver Cowdery, W.W. W. Phelps, and others in Missouri, in which the Lord made this principle known through the prophet Joseph Smith. Whether the revelation as it appears in the Doctrine and Covenants was first given July, uh, was first given July 12, 1843 or earlier, I care not. It is a fact, nevertheless, that this principle was revealed in an earlier date. Now, we know that the 1843, which is our now current section 132, was not given earlier because it, there's specifics in that dealing with the time period of 1843. So we know the exact text was not in his mind there. Um, but according to uh, Joseph Fielding, there was a, a revelation in 1831. Joseph Smith, according to Mary Elizabeth uh, Rollins Leitner, uh, so this, this is one of his uh, polygamous wives, uh, according to Mary, Joseph told her, The angel came to me three times between the years of 1834 and 1842 and said I was to obey that principle. So right here, he is claiming that God told him to institute this, uh, this, uh, this practice. Now, the historical record indicates that Joseph Smith contracted his first plural marriage in either 1835 or 36 in Kirtland, Ohio with Fanny Alger. Fanny was 19 years old, live -in help, uh, paid live and help with the Smiths. Um, now, upon learning of the relationship, Emma, um, and, and then Emma learns of it, and then Joseph actually calls Oliver, and Oliver actually sides with Emma, who they, and they reject it, and, and Emma kicks Fanny out, and Fanny, Fanny leaves with her family to Missouri. Now, as a postscript, her family um, stayed active members of the church, followed the saints over to Utah Valley, and died there. Fanny uh, stayed in Missouri, married um, a non-member, had children, uh, never spoke of her relationship with Joseph Smith. When asked about it, she said that she chose to kept that, keep that private to her. So uh, we don't have recollection from Fanny or from, um, or from Joseph about the relationship. We know very little except that there was a marriage and that Emma learns of it, and, um, and that's the end of it. So evidence supports that afterward the prophet taught no one about plural marriage or even mentioned the subject during the next five to six years. Multiple documents support that Joseph Smith was hesitant to revisit the practice of plural marriage in Nauvoo. So for example, we have Helen Mar Kimball, uh, excuse me, Helen Mar Kimball Whitney saying, um, it, had it not been for the fear of the Lord's displeasure, Joseph would have shrunk from the undertaking and would have continued silent as he did for years. For the years she's talking about between the Fanny Alger experience and, and Nauvoo. Um, she also said that Joseph, quote, put off the dreaded day as long as he dared. Lucy Walker, in the deposition of the Temple Law Transcript, we'll get to um, this case later, she, in a deposition, reported that Joseph, quote, had his doubts about it, for he debated it in his own mind. So the chronology further supports the likelihood that sometime before April 5th, 1841, when the prophet was sealed to plural wife Louisa Beam, and that's the first after Fanny, the angel returned for a second visit to admonish Joseph to use the sealing authority and to obey the earlier directives. So, for example, Mary E. Leitner says, Joseph told me he was afraid when the angel appeared to him, 
and told him to take other wives. He hesitated, and the angel appeared to him the third time with a drawn sword in his hand and threatened his life if he did not fulfill the commandment. We have about 20 different recollections of this um, angelic visit with the, the, the drawn sword. So uh, according to Erastus Snow, Erastus Snow claimed that Joseph, quote, had to plead on his knees before the angel for his life. On another occasion, Joseph reportedly affirmed, God commanded me to obey it through a marriage. He said to me that unless I accept it and introduce it and practice it, I, together with my people, should be damned and cut off from this time henceforth. Joseph F. Smith. Joseph Smith was commanded to take wives. He hesitated and postponed it, seeing the consequences and the trouble that it would bring, and he shrank from the responsibility. But he prayed to the Lord for it to pass as Jesus did, but Jesus had to drink it to the dregs, and so it was with Joseph Smith. The Lord had revealed it to him and said, Now it is the time for it to be practiced, but it was not until he had been told he must practice it or be destroyed that he made the attempt. So that's kind of the, the chronology of, of the institution. Um, some, some, uh, some part of the revelation coming in 1831, then apparently him being told or him claiming that he was told to practice it three times between 1834 30, and 41, trying with Fanny, putting it off for another five to six years, and then a, apparently again, as claimed, um, being told more forcefully that he had to do so. So, conclusion for premise B, did Joseph Smith claim that God commanded him to practice polygamy? Yes, he did claim that. Uh, in fact, he claimed that, that God did so very forcefully with angelic visitors. How about premise A? Polygamy is never commanded by God. Premise A is unsupported by both Christian and LDS-specific canonized texts. So, of course, I think most people are aware about the Old Testament period where over 40 important figures have more than one wife, including Solomon, Moses has three wives, Zipporah, the daughter of um, uh, Pobab, and the Ethiopian woman. Um, many are aware of the practice of Leverite marriage, where the, which obligated a man whose brother has left a widow without heir to marry her. Um, I think we're all aware that the Old Testament is... Uh, explicitly not condemning the practice of polygamy. It's, while it's not forbidden, it does include specific regulations about how to practice it. So, for example, in Exodus 21, we get, um, if he take another wife for himself, her food, her clothing, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. In other words, right, you, you can't diminish the uh, living situation of, the, of your first wife if you choose to take a second wife. Uh, we also have what's uh, kind of known as the, the rights of the firstborn. Um, this is the NIV version. If a man has two wives and he loves one but not the other, and both bear him sons, but the firstborn is the son of the wife he does not love, when he wills his property to his sons, he must not give the rights of the firstborn to the son of the wife he loves in preference to his actual firstborn. The son of the wife he does not love. He must acknowledge the son of his unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double share of all he has. That son is the first son of his father's strength. The right of the firstborn belongs to him. So we have specific legal, reg legal regulations on the practice um, in the Old Testament. Now, the New Testament has no explicit condemnation of the practice, although three, there's three passages in the letters of Timothy and Titus that state that church leaders should be, quote, the husband of one wife. So this has been read by some Christian sects as a prohibition on the practice. Others argue that polygamy is allowed, but not for church leaders. So others argue that the passage refers only to church leaders not divorcing their first wives. So um, it's, there's no consensus in terms of um, the Christian tradition on uh, New Testament. Now, LDS-specific canon, of course, makes it clear that the Lord may, under some circumstances, command the practice of plural marriage. So this is, uh, this is Jacob, where it may, basically condemns the practice um, you know, for the Lord delight in the chastity woman, whoredoms are an abomination. So, um, finally it gets to verse 30 where it says, For if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people, otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. So, uh, Jacob gives the, I think what's generally understood is the rule that, uh, you know, monogamy is the standard unless there's a deviation commanded specifically by God. But so in Doctrine and Covenants 132, we get the specific allowance for the practice of polygamy. God commanded Abraham and Sarah, gave Hagar to Abraham to wife. And why did she do it? Because this was the law, and from Hagar sprang many people. This, therefore, was fulfilling, among other things, the promises. Was Abraham, therefore, under condemnation? Verily I say unto you, Nay, for I, the Lord, commanded it. I am the Lord thy God. I gave unto thee, that my servant Joseph, an appointment to re and restore all things. So 132 is, is famous for you know, being the... Uh, the polygamy section. Mainly, though, it deals with um, eternal marriage. It's a very small the part that talks about 
polygamy specifically, the revelation is much more about eternal marriage, and, and that's the focus of Joseph's teachings is not polygamy, it's, it is eternal marriage. So premise A, polygamy is never commanded by God. It's not supported by Christian nor LDS specific canonized texts. So as a result, this argument fails. Um, you, you, you cannot show that God could have never um, ordered the institution of polygamy from either Christian or non-Christian texts. So it's very similar to uh, the argument from fallibility you went through. If you hold the position that God could never command polygamy to be instituted, you're free to do so, but in doing so, you're stepping outside of the Christian and LDS-specific tradition. Um, and, and you just have to recognize that you're doing that on your own, you know, that's based on your personal opinion there. So what's the argument, too, from polygamy? It goes typically something like this. Um, polygamy could have been commanded by God in the 1830s, so we grant you that the argument one is valid, right? In, in theory, it could have been uh, commanded. However, if God were to command polygamy in the 1830s, he would command that women were not to be married unless they were, you know, insert some age that you're comfortable with, 18, 16, 21, whatever age, because polygamy always includes sex. Now, and, and this is due to the fact that we are very concerned with underage, uh, having sex with underage girls. So, premise B then, Joseph Smith married girls under 15 years old, therefore Joseph Smith's polygamy could not have been commanded by God. Right? Oftentimes, you never, you, typically you don't see the arguments, this, I, I break this out very logically, typically what you see is, Joseph Smith married 14 year old girls, and the conclusion therefore is that it was, you know, it's Warren Jeff's territory, it's, there's no way God could have commanded a practice like that. But that's what this means, right? So they're not arguing, they're saying in theory, fine, but there's no way because this was how it was practiced, okay? So did Joseph Smith marry girls under 15 years old? Um, let's look at premise B. Joseph Smith was sealed to 10 women under the age of 20. Four were 19, three were 17, one was 16, and two were 14. So you'll see uh, here's Fanny at 19 that we talked about. Um, we know essentially nothing about Nancy Winchester. We know a lot about Helen Mark Kimball. There's the two 14-year-olds. So he did. He did marry girls under 15 years of age. Now, let's look at premise A here. Um, is it true that if God were to command, he would have commanded that women were not to be married unless they were some age? And is it true because polygamy always includes sex? First thing is that these marriages were not underage in terms of legal standards. So even today, even in the 21st century, 14-year-old girls are allowed to marry in the United States with the approval of their parents. Um, all of these marriages did have approval of their parents. So, even, But even today, if you look up, you can look it up online, and it's uh, marriage law is a state-by-state -state thing. It's not a federal law. Uh, so states vary in their age, but um, some states... Uh, certainly allow even today this type of, of marriage age, assuming that um, there's approval of their parents. So these marriages were legal. They were also not culturally unusual. Why do we say this? Now it's significant that none of Joseph's contemporaries complained about the age differences between polygamous or monogamous marriage partners. This was simply part of their environment and culture. Thus, despite looking for every available criticism, it is significant that age was not an issue. Right. It, so if it had been as culturally inappropriate as it is in our day, and we call it out when it is, they would have called it out in their day. Um, his contemporaries were looking for, they certainly complained about polygamy. So they would, have had, they, would have had, they would have loved to complain if it was culturally significant in terms of the age difference. Um, finally, is it true that uh, the, these marriages included sex? Now the evidence is that these marriages were actually not consummated. So in Utah, Brigham Young instructed polygamous men to wait to consummate their ceilings to younger brides until they were at least 18. While it is impossible to document, it does appear that this policy began in Nauvoo with Joseph Smith. Why do we say that? What's the evidence for that? Helen Moore Kimball, um, we, we showed her, she was one of the 14-year-olds. Um, she wrote more about plural marriage than any other female author in the 19th century. Uh, she was a proponent of it, she defended it in Joseph Smith. Uh, she included, she had two books, uh, Plural Marriage is Taught by the Prophet Joseph and Why We Practice Plural Marriage. She also kept a detailed journal throughout much of her life. She shared reminiscences in that, from that journal from the, in the Women's Exponent. So through these pages, Helen never describes even one time being alone with the Prophet without a chaperone. Her writings make it seem much more like a betrothal than a, a marriage that included uh, consummation. 
So references to intimate relations would not be um, would not be ex would would not be expected. Yet if the two spent time together as husband and wife, Helen might have made a passing reference to the interactions. Um, again, because she's a proponent of it, but none are found. So let me give you one example where it seems like this is a betrothal. Uh, according to Helen, during the winter of 1843, there were plenty of parties and balls. Some of the young gentlemen got up a series of dancing parties to be held at the mansion once a week. I had to stay home as my father had been warned by the prophet to keep his daughters away from there because of the black legs and certain ones of questionable character who attended there. I felt quite sore over it, right? So she's mad that she can't go and dance at, at these balls. Um, and thought it very unkind act and father to allow my brother to go and enjoy the dance, unrestrained with others of my companions, and fetter me down. For no girl loved dancing better than I did, and I really felt that it was too much to bear. It made the dull skull still more dull, and like a wild bird I longed, that should be longed, for the freedom that was denied me, and thought myself a much abused child, and that was pardonable if I did murmur. So, if she were uh, a, let's call it a, you know, what we think of as a real wife, um, she would be expected to be bearing children, right? Um, if it was consummated, was she would be home. This was after the time. This was after the marriage. This was after after the marriage. So uh, her writings make her make it seem as if her, her wedding, her her sealing was more of a betrothal rather than something that was um, actionable at the time. Um, and perhaps the most important is that Helen did not testify in the trial of 1892. Um, this trial is very very interesting on a number of levels, but. Um, just to give you background, in 1892, the RLDS Church, at that time led by Joseph Smith III, sued the Church of Christ of Temple Lot, disputing its claim to own the Temple Lot in Independence, Missouri. Right? If, so if you go to Independence, Missouri now, you'll meet uh, represent, representatives of the Church of Christ Temple Lot. Right? You don't meet the RLDS Church, but at this time the RLDS Church was trying to get that property back. Church of Christ Temple Lot held the physical possession. The RLDS Church took the official position that since it was the true successor of the church originally founded by Joseph Smith, it owned the property outright. Now, the LDS Church in Utah was not a party to the suit, but as you could probably guess, it, um, it was not um, a fan of the RLDS Church's position, RLDS Church's position that it was the quote-unquote true successor. So it provided support to the Church of Christ or the Temple Lot. Now, here's what the issue came down to. This is where it gets interesting. The issue was parsed like this. If the Church of Christ Temple Law could prove that plural marriage was part of the original church, then the RLDS Church was obviously not the true successor since it failed to practice such a key doctrine. So we actually litigated in a court of law in this country whether or not um, polygamy or plural marriage was part of the original uh, Mormon church in, in Nauvoo. And this is where we get um, a lot of really interesting documentation on the practice was through this trial. Now, Helen did not testify in 1892, but three of Joseph Smith's plural wives did. Lucy Walker, Emily Partridge, and Melissa Lott. They were all deposed. They all took depositions. They each testified to sexual relations with Joseph Smith. They each testified that, yes, this was a real polygamous marriage that included sexual relations. However, despite living geographically much closer than two of the three witnesses, right? So Melissa Lott lived 30 miles south in Lehigh. Lucy Walker lived uh, in Logan. Helen was right there, more, uh, more central. She did not testify. Why? A likely reason is that Helen could not provide the needed testimony. All three of Joseph Smith's wives who did testify affirmed that sexual relations were part of their plural marriages to the prophet. Testifying of either an unconsummated time in eternity sealing or an eternity-only marriage would have hurt the Temple Lot's case. Such marriages would have been easily dismissed as unimportant. So, in furtherance of that, Mary Elizabeth Leitner, Zining Huntington, and Patty Sessions, who were sealed into Joseph in eternity-only marriages, also did not include sexual relations, were similarly not deposed. So the only wives deposed were those that could affirmatively testify this was a real marriage that included sexual relations. Helen Moore Campbell, despite being a prolific writer, living closer, uh, a proponent of the practice, um, did, was not deposed in the Temple Lot case. How old were those other three? Oh, when they were deposed? No, when they... Oh, I, I couldn't tell you offhand. Like, which... They aren't... Um, were they one of those young ones? Uh, Melissa Lot was, was 19. I don't recognize any of the other names. Yeah. All right, so what's our conclusion? Premise A, what do we make of it? Polygamy could have been commanded by God in the 30s. If you grant that it's theologically possible in the Christian and LDS-specific uh, tradition, 
But if he were to command it, he would command it that, you know, there was some age restriction to this. Why? Because, um, you know, polygamy always includes sex. That's not supported by LDS-specific spe canonized text or the historical record. Marriage to younger brides was legal, was not culturally taboo, and further, the evidence suggests that these were not consummated marriages. This would be in line with later Utah policy uh, for uh, polygamy. Okay. So, there's a related argument from character that is based on polyandry. And here's how this argument goes. Uh, premise A, polyandry, which is the pr practice of plurality of husbands, is never commanded by God. B, Joseph Smith married women who were already married to other living men. This should be C, not D, excuse me. C, therefore in these marriages, Joseph Smith practiced polyandry. Therefore, Joseph Smith's polyandry was not commanded by God and was adultery. A, a, a prophet or apostle does not commit adultery. Therefore, Joseph Smith could not have been a prophet or apostle when he practiced polygamy. Okay? So this is actually an argument right, from, from character that's based on polyandry. Right? And you, you get to character from here. And you say, look, um, we'll, we'll forgive some sins, but a prophet or apostle would, would not be committing adultery. And that's where you get the tie-in to um, circumstantial argument. So, how about premise A? Polyandry or plurality of husbands is never commanded by God. Uh, the Revelation on Celestial and Plural Marriage, now section 132, contains three references to sexually polyandrous relations, and all three label them adultery, with two cases stating that the woman involved would, quote, would be destroyed. Church members who were personally taught by Joseph recalled only condemnations of the practice of polyandry. For example, when asked in 1852, what do you think of a woman having one more husbands than one? Brigham Young answered, this is not known to the law. The following year, Orson Pratt instructed, God is strictly forbidden in this Bible, plurality of husbands, and proclaimed it against it in his law. Excuse me. And then in October 8, 1869, George A. Smith taught that a plurality of husbands is wrong. So those that were personally taught by Joseph condemned the practice. The revelation Joseph gives condemns the practice as well. So... Premise A, polyandry applied of husbands is never commanded by God, is supported by LDS-specific canon and non-canonized texts. What about premise B, Joseph Smith married women who were already married to other living men. That is true. Joseph Smith was sealed to 14 men with legal spouses that were living. Here they are. Um, and some are non-members, some are members. Here's Orson Hyde, uh, his wife, Miranda Nancy Johnson. Uh, so here's the, the 14. What about this? This seems like an easy conclusion. Therefore, in these marriages, Joseph Smith practiced polyandry. We need to look at this a little bit more closely. Let's look at the evidence from Ruth Voss Sayers. She was uh, listed up here. Here's Ruth Voss. I said Bo Ruth Voss. Her husband was Edward Sayers. Well, there, the strongest affection sprang up between the prophet Joseph and Mr. Sayers. The latter, that's Mr. Sayers, not attaching much importance to the theory of a future life, insisted that his wife Ruth should be sealed to the prophet for eternity, as he himself should only claim her in this life. <laughs> she was accordingly, this, was accordingly sealed to the prophet in Emma Smith's presence, and thus were they, she became among, numbered among the prophet's plural wives. She, however, continued to live with Mr. Sayers and remained with her husband until his death. So it's very clear that um, in, in Ruth's case that this is an eternity only sealing. And not, he was not practicing a poly, not a practice polyandry uh, with, with Ruth. The lack of solid documentation is important because demonstrating the existence of actual polyandry could be done rather easily by quoting a single credible supportive statement if we had one. Just one well documented account from a participant or other close observer, of which we had dozens, right? We have, we have the women, we have the, the husbands, uh, we have the in, polygamy insiders, indicating that any of the 14 women had two genuine husbands at the same time would constitute evidence of polyandry. We have no documentation of this type at all. During his lifetime, even Joseph Smith's enemies failed to exploit the charge of polyandry. So after his communication, John C. Bennett, who we talked about, um, and identified several of Joseph Smith's plural wives, calling them, quote, spiritual wives. Yet Bennett never accused Joseph of genuine polyandry, nor did he invite the husbands of the women he listed to join with him in persecuting Joseph. 
even though he had appealed to many others to do so. It would have been, uh, again, the, the charge would have been labeled if it was available. Similarly, no declarations from other polygamy insiders have been found saying that Joseph taught polyandry was acceptable. No credible accounts from any of the 14 wives exist wherein they complained about it, even though many complaints about polygamy are recorded. Right? We have plenty of documentation of, of, uh, about how hard and, and difficult polygamy is. We, we have nothing about actual polyandry happening, ha happening. Finally, more remarkable is a lack of defense of the practice. Dozens of people were aware of some of these attorney-only ceilings. That no explanatory texts or defense, defensive references have surfaced is surprising if it was actually a legitimate polyandrous relationship. So why did these happen? That's the... The, the question then. And there's at least three possibilities. First, um, they may have created eternal family bonds or links. Now, you, you must remember that at this time in Nauvoo, the sealing practices were really nothing like we have today. So you had men being sealed to other men as their, um, as their fathers, right? So many men were sealed to Brigham Young and to Joseph Smith as a, as a, um, as a father uh, that were not in any, in any way related, but they were, I think, seeking to create eternal family bonds or links. So when you look at someone like, uh, you know, Orson Pratt and, and his wife, maybe it was, it was that. Um, the marriages could have been a way for Joseph to comply with the command to take plural wives in a manner that would be less painful for Emma, right? So he takes, he, he marries Louisa Beeman, uh, who's the first one after Fanny, and then he goes on a string about four or five of these eternity-only uh, ceilings. So so he could have been saying, look, I'm, I'm complying with this, you know, with this directive. Plural marriages that didn't include an earthly component or for attorney only would presumably have been less bothersome to Emma, right? There was, that's, that's the hard part it, as we think of it now is this, the earthly part, right? Um, finally, those involved may have believed that sealing would provide women blessings they might not otherwise receive in the next life, right? So if I'm in some way sealed to the prophet, that uh, there's maybe some, some uh, blessings there. So... These are three reasons why these sealings could have occurred. So what's the conclusion? Joseph Smith taught that a genuine plurality of husbands called polyandry was adultery. He taught that in Revelations, and he taught to, to all polygamy insiders. There is no indication, that's an incorrect word there, there is no indication that he was hypocritical in this regard. His sealings to women with civil husbands appear to have been eternity only, meaning that they would only take effect after death, and in some cases, maybe even not that, with someone like Orson um, uh, who's, who was a, you know, uh, active member. They did not constitute marriages for this life. Therefore, premise D is unsupported and the argument fails. Premise D, of course, was that he was actually practicing polyandry. All right. A related argument from character or fallibility. This is based on polygamy itself. Polygamy could not have, could have been commanded by God in the 1830s. However, if God were to command polygamy in the 1830s, it would be immoral for Joseph Smith to practice it without the full knowledge and consent of Emma Smith. Joseph did not always have the full knowledge and consent of Emma. Therefore, Joseph's actions were immoral. A proper apostle does not commit the immoral action of practicing even God-sanctioned polygamy without the full knowledge and consent of his wife. Therefore, Joseph Smith was not a proper apostle when he practiced polygamy. Now, this, again, is an argument uh, based on fallibility. What are the appropriate limits of moral mistakes by a, a prophet or apostle? Let's look at premise B. Joseph did not always have the full knowledge and consent of Emma. This is another, another case where we lack um, solid historical documentation. Uh, looking at Emma Smith's personal interactions with polygamy is very challenging. She, she pops up in the historical record, but we have nothing close to... To full documentation. However, I would argue that this premise is most probably correct, right? That he, and that uh, it was not always practiced with the full knowledge and consent, right? So it is unknown whether Joseph received consent to the to the marriage of Fanny, right? He could have told Emma that he had received a re revelation on polygamy. We have no, we just don't know. But it's undoubtable that she disapproved and sent Fanny away. We we read that she. Uh, saw them in the barn, and we don't know what that means, whether that was the actual marriage, was it was them talking, was it them kissing, was it them having sex, we, we don't know what she saw, but um, upon seeing that, she sent uh, Fanny away. Um, we will read later how um, she consented to a few marriages, but then once, um, once she um, experienced what that was like, uh, having one night with them in the mansion house, she sent them away. So, Again, 
the most difficult thing that any of these people are dealing with, and Emma's um, no doubt had, had um, big issues here, um, as they all did. So I'd argue that's most probably correct, right? Because at least in that point, at that point, she wasn't consenting to Fanny. So I think premise B is, um, is most probably correct. The only solid dating that we have for when Emma undeniably knew of Joseph's plural marriages was um, in May of 1843. Why? Because we have Emma Smith at that month participated um, in Joseph's marriages to four plural brides, Eliza and Emily Partridge and Sarah and Maria Lawrence. And here's where we get to um, her kind of up and down um, feelings about this. So Emily Partridge testified, right, again in the deposition, the Temple Lot transcript is where we get a lot of this documentation. Concerning Emma's immediate reaction, she, Emma, consented to the marriage at the time that she was bitter after that. After the next day, you might say that she was bitter, right? So um, that's the first time that we, that we know for sure that she was involved and, um, and at least participating in some sense. Um, in July of 1843, the tensions between Joseph and Emma reached kind of a new high. Um, in an attempt to encourage her acceptance of plural marriage, Hiram Smith requested on the 12th that Joseph write down a revelation on the subject that he would present to her. This is how we get section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It comes during this period where um, there's a lot of turmoil between Joseph and Emma. So Hiram said, look, Joseph, I'll convince her if you just write me down the revelation and I'll go take it to her. George D. Smith, this AM I wrote a revelation consisting of 10 pages on the order of the priesthood. This is section 132, showing the designs in Moses, Abraham, David, and Solomon having many wives and concubines, etc. After it was wrote, Presidents Joseph and Hiram presented it and read it to Emma, really it was only Hiram, who said she did not believe a word of it and appeared very rebellious. Right, so she was not accepting of section 132. Um, according to William Clayton, Joseph told Hiram, I told you, you do not know Emma as well as I did. All right, so Joseph um, was not under any, uh, he, was not, he was not thinking that the, the revelation would, uh, would appease Emma. Uh, the very next day, Emma and Joseph took serious counsel together with some sort of agreement being reached. In a lot of documents, we have um, them calling in William Clayton, and they're both crying. This is an enormously difficult time for both of them. Um, this agreement that they apparently reached had at least two parts. First, it appears to have required Joseph to obtain Emma's permission before marrying any new plural wives. Evidently, the second part was designed to assure that if anything happened to Joseph or their marriage, Emma would be financially supported. So William Clayton, who was called in um, to kind of mediate this discussion with Joseph and Emma, recorded that only hours after Emma rejected Hiram in the revelation, Joseph told me to deed all the unencumbered lots to Emma and the children. He appears much troubled about Emma. So, um, uncovered lots, of course, are the lots in Nauvoo that, um, that they owned. Benjamin F. Benson, Benjamin F. Johnson later asserted that during the final months of Joseph's life, several of Joseph's plural wives lived in the Nauvoo mansion. Quote, I do know that at his mansion home was living Maria and Sarah Lawrence, and one of, the, of Cornelius P. Lott's daughters as his plural wives, with the full knowledge of his wife Emma, of their married relations to him. Again, we, this, this is trying to show you the fragmentary nature of the, the record about Emma and, and her um, dealing with this. Now, there's no doubt that Emma and Joseph remained committed to each other um, throughout their lives. And um, they, uh, certainly to society, Nabu appeared to, you know, to be together as, as husband and wife, um, staying loyal to each other. Joseph, of course, asked Emma to accompany him to Carthage after his, um, his being asked to appear there. She had to stay with the children, but reportedly requested a blessing from him. He was, didn't have much time, so he told her to write out, a, write out the best blessing she could think of, and he would sign the same on his return. So you can actually read this blessing online that she wrote herself. He didn't get to, to sign it. Um, the text of the blessing that survives in a later transcript form included Emma's wish, quote, I desire with all my heart to honor and respect my husband as my head, ever to live in his confidence, and by acting in unison with him to retain the place which God has given to me by his side. Um, she's devastated upon his, uh, his murder. After his death, family friend John P. Green reported seeing Emma, quote, weeping and wailing bitterly in a loud and unrestrained voice, her face covered with her hands. He remarked, this affliction would be to her a crown of life, and she allegedly replied, my husband was my crown. Um, Emma died in 1879. She, of course, stayed in Nauvoo. Um, according to their son, Alexander, her final words spoken at, at their last breath were, quote, Joseph, Joseph, yes, yes, I am coming. So 
What's our conclusion? It is doubtless that Emma Smith's polygamy-related trials were great. Um, however, she did remain true to her husband throughout her life, and she never denied that he was uh, the prophet. So, what do we uh, do with premise A? Polygamy could have been commanded by God. However, if it were, it would be immoral for Joseph to practice it without the, without the full knowledge and consent of Emma. If Joseph was commanded to practice polygamy, it seems that this premise is actually incorrect, since in Christian and LDS-specific theology, one's highest moral responsibility is actually to God. And, and this obviously would have put Joseph in an extremely difficult position. Um, Richard Bushman, I, I, I really like how he uh, sums it up, if you can. Um, they were in impossible positions. Joseph caught between his revelation and his wife, Emma between a practice she detested and belief in her husband. And then he's talking about that agreement that they read. The agreement re represented some kind of compromise. Um, all you can read, when I read these histories, I, the, my overwhelming feeling is compassion, actually for, for both of them as I read that. that um, I, I think this is correct, that, um, that it, was a, it was the most difficult thing that either of them um, ever went through. So, what's our conclusion? There are four distinct arguments against LDS truth claims that are based on the practice of polygamy. The first argument, right, is a carte blanche, look, polygamy can never be commanded by God, it's always to fulfill the, it's always man-made to fulfill their sexual desires. Um, Joseph Smith claimed that God commanded a practice of, you know, therefore he was lying and a prophet or apostle doesn't lie. We talked about how premise A is unsupported, both by Christian and LDS-specific uh, texts, that um, it's, it's not true that polygamy is never commanded by God. Although we did talk about how premise B was supported, that God, it, Joseph did claim that God commanded him to practice it, but because premise A fails, the argument fails. Again, you can hold to premise A. I don't want to... <laughs> you can hold to premise A. You can say, look, I don't believe that God would ever do that, but you're stepping entirely outside the Christian and LDS-specific tradition to do so if you want to hold to that premise. Argument two is about the type of practice, right? So, look, it could have been practice. However, um, if, it, if it was commanded, God would have commanded some sort of age... Um, uh, age for the for brides. Why? Because polygamy always includes sex, and we have to be very protective of of, of underage girls. Um, we talked about how Joseph Smith did marry girls under 15 years of, of age. That is supported. But we talked about how premise A is unsupported. Why? Because most of the evidence is that these marriages to um, to the 14 year olds were not consummated. We talked about how about Helen Mark Kimball not testifying. We talked about how they were legal and how, also how they were culturally acceptable. They were not criticized by any contemporaries in terms of the age difference. So we talked about premise A was, is unsupported. The argument from character based on polyandry is typically thrown out, um, again, in a laundry list of, of, of criticisms that go something like this. Joe Smith married 14-year-old girls. He also married women that were married to other men. And they leave it at that, uh, wanting you to, to take the premise that Joseph Smith practice polyandry in those relationships. We talked about how that was unsupported, that all the evidence, that we have no evidence of actual polyandry, that Joseph Smith condemned the practice, his closest followers condemned the practice, um, and we have specific evidence that um, for in Ruth's case it was eternity only, and that seems to be the case for all 14 of those. We talked about three reasons why those could have happened, um, those uh, seemingly polyandrous um, marriages could have happened. Finally, we talked about the fallibility argument. Uh, th this is, uh, we talked about the, the difficulties of, of Emma and Joseph's relationship through this. Um, but we, we talked about how would it would have been immoral for him to practice it if God had commanded it, how that's most likely unsupported. We also have to, um, we have to keep open the possibility that it was immoral, that he made mistakes in how he instituted it. And this goes back to the idea of fallibility. If God had commanded him to practice it, it is likely or it's possible that he made mistakes and how he did so and that harmed his relationship with his uh, with his Emma and that is something that he would have to repent for and that they would have to, to work out um, we don't know the, the doc the, the record isn't isn't clear enough and I'm uh, and I don't think any of us are perhaps in a position to make that declaration but we have to leave it open and and it's okay um, it's okay if if that happened um, I mean Again, it would have caused 
problems and, and harm to their relationship, it doesn't therefore mean that um, he's not a prophet or apostle. We talked about how those people uh, can and do make mistakes, both moral and theological. So if it was, in fact, uh, commanded and he still made mistakes in that institution and how he did it, how he went about it, um, we have to leave open that possibility that uh, he'll have to repent of those and, and heal his relationship with Emma. So that's it. Any, any questions on the arguments from polygamy? Um, 